Over the past few days, there's been a lot of speculation about this innovation with OpenAI called QSTAR, which apparently was the trigger for this whole boardroom saga that led to the firing and then rehiring of Sam Altman. Ultimately, I guess nobody really knows what QSTAR is. Two of the more credible ones share a lot of similarities. So this, this one is by an AI researcher at NVIDIA called Jim Fan, who did his PhD under Fei-Fei Li at Stanford. And then also there's another AI researcher called Nathan Lambert. So I, I think there's some, you know, potentially some links to what they're saying. And when you read through their posts, they're quite technical. So what I wanted to do is just to break down at a, at a high level conceptually, what exactly is the you know, innovation. If we just read through it here, Nathan posted a blog a few hours before I did and discussed very similar ideas, tree of thought and process reward model. And then what Nathan said was, the Q hypothesis I can stand behind from literature, tree of thought reasoning, something to search over, process reward models, rank all the steps of reasoning, GPT-4 to score all vertices of the tree, Q learning to optimize, and you can see here, Jim has written a lot more detail about how he believes QSTAR is um, modeled on some of the key innovations that made AlphaGo possible, including things like reinforcement learning, unit, use, using both a policy neural network and a value neural network, and self-playing which generates a lot of synthetic data that enabled AlphaGo to exceed human capacity. An AI can never become superhuman just by imitating human data alone. So there's a, a lot of details here and references to papers, so we're going to go through that step by step right now. So here we've got a little diagram with six topics, which we're going to talk through today. Let's zoom in. We're going to talk about using LLMs for math problems, think, thinking fast and slow, chain of thought and tree search, reward models, process versus output supervised reward models, and then finally perpetual machine to reach superhuman capabilities. We're going to do all of this at a very high level. This is actually getting a bit late right here. We will have some references to papers, as you can see here, which you can read if you want to go into more detail. So the motivating problem that we're trying to solve here is that LLMs such as GPT were built as large language models to predict the next token from left to right and was not built to solve math problems. However, as the LLMs have become more and more powerful, people have started to explore how we can make them more capable to solve complex math problems. One of the techniques is this idea of chain of thought prompting. If you just did standard input-output prompting, you might write a question such as, the cafeteria had 23 apples. If they used 20 to make lunch and bought six more, how many apples do they have? And it just went straight into the answer and said it's 27, which is wrong. However, if you ask, ask GPT to talk through its thinking process and listing out the steps, it is more likely to get the answer correct. So in this case, it output, the cafeteria had 23 apples originally. They used 20 to make lunch. So they had 23 minus 20 equals 3. They bought 6 more apples. So they have 3 plus 6 equals 9. The answer is 9, which is correct. Prompting GPT to talk through the steps improves accuracy. Which takes us into this second bubble, thinking fast and slow. I'm sure many of you would have seen this book by Daniel Kahneman. So this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is a 2011 popular science book by psychologist Daniel Kahneman. The book's main thesis is a differentiation between two modes of thought, 
System one is fast, instinctive, and emotional. System two is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. The reason why I bring this up here is that LLMs, the way they work is closer to system one, in that it's just quickly predicting the, the next token without too much advanced planning or too much thinking about what the various options are before it heads down a path. However, for something like a complex math problem, the, the thinking is that a system two mode of thought is more suitable. It is slower, more deliberative, and more logical. If you think about how you might solve a complex math problem, you might think through a few different ways of approaching it before you select your final answer. And this is corroborated by Yan LeCun's post about Q star. So Yan LeCun is a Meta's a chief scientist, so he's telling you to ignore the complete nonsense about Q star, blah blah blah, and w what he is saying is that QSTAR is OpenAI's attempts at planning. I've been advocating for deep learning architecture capable of planning since 2016. So it is about how you, in a sense, slow down the LLM so it's not just rushing into spitting out the next word into a more deliberative way of reasoning. Coming to the next bubble, chain of thought, also called COT, versus tree search. So the idea here, and this um, was discussed in a paper uh, published by a number of researchers, many of whom are with Google DeepMind, in a paper called Tree of Thoughts. And the idea is that even chain of thought is not comprehensive enough you can see on this uh, diagram ex extracted from the paper that you've got the input-output kind of prompting. So that's, that's basically like this one, like you ask a question and it just gives you the answer. And then you've got this chain of thought prompting, which is like a, a single reasoning path, which is kind of linear. And then you've got this variant on COT. But what this paper is proposing is that instead of this linear way of breaking down one line of thought, you would think about, oh, what is a sensible next step? And maybe there are a number of different options, and in here there might be three. And then if you went down one path, then what would be the logical next step after that? And then there, it could start branching off into this wide tree. And the idea behind tree of thought is that in order for LLMs to do well at mathematical reasoning for complex problems, it should be able to just look ahead and look at different ways of solving the problem and choose in an intelligent way which is the best path and then output that back to the user. But the, the problem with this kind of tree search is the size of the tree. In, in this example, there aren't a lot of branches under each node. So you can do a brute force search where you go down every single path and then you choose the best one. But in the case of games like Go or in the case of an LLM, where the number of outputs at each step could be infinite, doing a brute force tree search where you go down every node, every branch, will just take an, a ridiculous amount of time and a crazy amount of computational power. What you want to do is to have some way of scoring the different branches so you can reduce the amount of work that you need to do to come up with the highest probability right answer. That takes us on to the reward models. Reward models are essentially another neural network that can help you score 
the different options that you have in your tree so you can make more informed decisions about which branches to go down and how deep to go down to, to increase the probability of getting the best answer for a given amount of computational power. And these two screenshots here is an extract from a, a YouTube video explaining how reinforcement learning works in AlphaGo. The channel's here, you can uh, watch it for yourself, it's a great video. The idea here is that you are at a certain state of the gameplay and your next step you have many different options across the board because you can put your piece down at any space in this board that is not already occupied. But here they've shown two branches. And as you, if you assume that you put your piece here, then what are the next steps following on from that? And then what are the next steps following on from that? By going down each branch, you can eventually have some kind of heuristic to estimate your likelihood of winning the game down that path without having to go down the entire tree, which is massive for a game like Go. Here we've gone down like one, two, three, four, five steps, and that takes a certain degree of computational power, but if you wanted to shrink that further, you can actually only take one step and then just take the probabilities at this stage. So really you're kind of trying to balance the accuracy of your of your ability to select the best path with the amount of searching you have to do to get there. Now you might ask, well that's for AlphaGo. In, in, in the case of an LLM, like what is the equivalent of that and how might we go about training LLMs with information on how good the, the steps are that they're proposing? Well, this kind of takes us to this concept of process versus output supervised reward models, PRMs versus ORMs. And to cut things short, the idea behind this paper is that we should give feedback to the LLM after it outputs every step. So it knows how good each step is and it knows where it went wrong. This uh, piece came out of a paper published by OpenAI called Let's Verify Step by Step in May 2023. The fact that this paper exists also reinforces the fact that there's a lot of people working in, within OpenAI on how to get LLMs to be better at planning ahead. Let's take a look at this example. A class of 30 students recently took a test. So this is a math problem that was posed to GPT-4. If 20 students scored 80 points, 8 students scored 90 points, and 2 students scored 100 points, then what was the class average bracket the mean on this test. And in order to solve this problem, instead of jumping straight into an output, the LLM is encouraged to think about it step by step. To find the class average, I need to add up all the scores and divide by the number of students. And where you see the color here is where a human has actually gone in to rate how good that step is. And in this case, they had only three types of scores. There's positive, negative, or neutral. And if it's green, it means that it's a good step. I can use a shortcut to add up the scores since they are grouped by value. For example, instead of adding 80 plus 80 plus 80 20 times, I can just multiply 80 by 20 to get the same result. Similarly, I can multiply 90 by 8 and 100 by 2 to get the sums of those groups. So, the total sum of the scores is 80 times 20 plus 90 times 8 plus 100 times 2. I can use the distributive property of multiplication to simplify this expression. 
and here it is like this next step where it kind of messed things up. So it says it is equivalent to 80 times bracket 20 plus 1 plus 90 times 8 plus 100. And I'm kind of not really sure how it got there from this, so it was scored as being red. That is 80 times 21 plus 720 plus 100. Again, that's red. I can do the arith arithmetic in my head or use a calculator. 80 times 21 is uh, 1680, so the total sum is 1680 plus 720 plus 100, which is 2500. So you'll see that even though this is not the correct answer for this, it is a correct step following on from this. So that's why it's in green. Now to find the average, I need to divide 2,500 by 30, blah, blah, blah. And, and so in the end, it got to the answer. You can see here, if you think about this as a tree, maybe this first step, this is one option. The LLM can also think of maybe a number of different options as being its first step. And then given each of those steps, it can think of a number of different options as being the second step. And so it can form a, a, a tree. And so with this reinforcement learning with human feedback method that's done at the process level as opposed to the output level, the model can learn how good each of the steps are and when it tends to get it wrong. Just to explain what is meant by output supervised reward models, these are basically reward models that only give a reward if the answer is correct. But for complicated mathematical problems, LLMs get the answer wrong most of the time. And simply by telling the LLM that the answer is wrong actually is not very helpful information because it does not know where it went wrong. PRM, by doing it at each step, it is able to really teach the LLM where things went wrong. So anyway, there's a whole kind of area of research around how to create these uh, reward models or sometimes called value policy neural networks to help to score these, the, you know, the, the options that you have in the tree. Just a quick comment here about how LLMs are able to crunch numbers like this, like addition, multiplication. What's really cool about large language models is that they're not only able to write natural language, but they have also ingested a ton of code. So it's also able to write code. And through its uh, code interpreter functionality, it's also able to execute that code. So for example, if it needed to crunch some numbers here, it could well uh, behind the scenes have built its own calculator and run it to do those calculations and then pass the results back to the large language model. Finally, you might think, okay, well, that all sounds like really sensible research and Yan LeCun said he's been working on it since 2016. What's the big deal? Like, why, why are people talking about this being a step to AGI and potentially having led the board to take some pretty drastic actions? Well, I, I think this is where the, the leap comes in. This approach is called reinforcement learning, also referred to as Q-learning. This is the method that AlphaGo used to train itself. What's really interesting about AlphaGo is that it was able to beat humans in playing the game Go because it didn't just use historical gameplay data by humans to learn. What it did was to become its own teacher. A neural network is trained to predict AlphaGo's own move selections and also the winner of AlphaGo's games. This neural network improves the strength of tree search, resulting in higher quality move selection and stronger self-play in the next iteration. And if we go down here, so much progress towards AI has been made using supervised learning systems. However, it's 
Export data is often expensive, unreliable, or simply unavailable. And when it is available, it imposes a ceiling on the performance of systems trained in this manner. In contrast, reinforcement learning systems are trained from their own experience, in principle allowing them to exceed human capabilities and to operate in domains where human expertise is lacking. Recently, there has been rapid progress towards this goal using deep neural networks trained by reinforcement learning. These systems, systems have outperformed humans in computer games, blah, blah, blah. So it is this idea that if you can have a generator that also has a reward model that scores itself, it, it can become like a perpetual machine that makes itself better and better and be better beyond the realm of human capability. And just a very simple diagram here, this was something suggested by uh, Nathan. Here you've got the generator LLM, which is essentially your GPT-4 that's creating the different options in the tree. And then you've got some kind of reward neural net that informs the choices of which branch to go down with the tree without having to go through like a brute force search. And through this, it's able to kind of self-play or generate experiences all by itself at a rate that humans cannot aim to match. And through this, they can create a lot of synthetic data, aka synthetic experiences, and get much better at, at math than humans can comprehend. In the Reuters release, it was suggested that one of the board's concerns about this Q-star innovation is that it's able to break an encryption method called AES-192. These encryption systems are designed to work because a certain kind of math problem is too difficult for humans to solve in a finite amount of time. But if through these reinforcement working techniques where our AI models can exceed the mathematical capability of humans, then perhaps these fundamental assumptions that underpin our encryption methods may be broken. The ramifications of that would be tremendous. For example, cryptocurrencies are essentially based on cryptography and this kind of technology, so that could be broken. All of the things that we think are private being passed over the internet could be broken. None of us really know what QSTAR means. At least we've learned something new by going through Jim Fan's Twitter post.